Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. I'm Ross Carl. Joining me, of course, James Parsons, Bryn Hall, Crusaders halfback down in Canterbury. And boys, it's been a big week for rugby. It's been a sad week. It's been an exciting week. It's been all sorts. It's been quite an emotional roller coaster. Um, but let's start with the tragic passing of Joel Evendiri and Inga Twingamala. The Jipper, you're a blues man. Tell me a little bit of your memories that you must have met uh, Inga along the way, or Joe Alley. Yeah, you obviously had a little bit to do with both of them, and obviously growing up, watched a hell of a lot of Joe Alley doing some special stuff in a Blues jersey. And when Ted um, was involved in coaching with us, he brought a lot of the 96 legends through to present jerseys. And like sometimes like guys will come in there sort of like that Phil Gould sort of inspiring hard edge speech but Joely just rolled up and just said have fun boys with, do it with a smile on your face and here's your jersey you know like he was just that's how he played the game you know he did it he did it for the love of it and the enjoyment and I think it's shone through in all his highlights that we've seen um, you know of, of recent days um, I'll tell you what if you watch that um, highlight of his to get on the outside of the Sharks play I think it might have been Joubert yeah yeah didn't Caleb Clark get outside Wes Houston look very reminiscent? Like I think it was because I was watching the highlights the night before, and then I saw him go on the outside. I was like, man, that was pretty impressive. Just a clean set of heels, right, Bryn? They just go, <laughs> saw it and went. But it was almost the same line. It was like, yeah. oh, it's beautiful to see. You obviously grew up watching a little yeah, bit of Joe Alley. Yeah, I did, mate. And I think the biggest thing, my earliest memories, my dad actually got a lot of things off from also the chip and chase. He was a massive... Person for getting through the line break and then doing a chip and chase over the last defender, usually the fullback, and you would almost just regather it right in front of him off the skill set that he had with that. But yeah, mate, I um, was actually there with Jip. I remember when Ted brought in a lot of those Blues men um, in the '96 and kind of the guys that um, foot the path for the Blues and at the start. And you know, Joe Alley was such a, a bubbly and just a, a happy go lucky guy, like Jip said. He uh, just came in and said, Enjoy yourself. and you could just kind of tell that's what his mindset when he was playing rugby, just went out there and enjoyed himself and, you know, things happened in and around him on attack end and defence. And so, um, yeah, really tough, really tough day for New Zealand rugby, not only with Joe Alley, but obviously Inga as well, who was a big, um, not only for just the All Blacks, but I think the Pacific Islanders as well and what he brought to their community and um, and also, you know, what he does, did off the field as well. Mm. It's, it's really tragic. And in a short lifetime, they brought a lot of joy to a lot of us. So we'd like to throw our condolences out there to the families of both Joelle and Inga. Um, we really appreciate what they did for rugby and obviously as men as well. They were wonderful people to deal with along the way. Very, very nice people. Let's carry on, though. Roger Tuivasa-Shek. Let's get into the quick fire rounds. Asked you last week and going to ask you again this week. Is Roger Tuivasa-Shek in All Black this year? Yes. Yes incredible debut. Apart from a missed tackle, I thought he was incredible. Have we already seen the match of the season in that game, the Blues versus the Canes, with the Canes coming through right at the end? No. <laughs> um, the first two rounds, it's the game of the, obviously the game of the, the game, but um, there's probably going to be some more belters moving forward. <laughs> Are you telling me you didn't enjoy the end of that? It was tough. It was a tough finish. <laughs> After what I would say the best 40 minutes the Blues have put out on the field in about eight years. It was very, very impressive. So incredibly dominant with so many great players and so many maybe unexpected players for some people standing out in a lot of ways. They'll get into that soon. Team with the most to work on, Bryn. Uh, Ndrua. Agreed. Well, uh, Actually, no, because we've got the same, I'll go something different. I think the Rebels. The Rebels. I think the Rebels, oh, I didn't see that 13-plus against the Force coming. I know the Force are playing well. It's not disrespectful. But they almost went backwards from that Queensland game. OK, who was your standout player from Super Rugby Pacific in round two? Has to be Artie. Oh, I just thought, not even the try. I got 14 carries. He's got 18 out of 20 tackles. Like, man, he is a big part of how they came back in that game to win it. Not just the try, just the work, the sheer work he put in. Man, he was he's just phenomenal. He's such a phenomenal player. It's just ridiculous. To have that sort of stats, both sides of the ball, big engine, and then have the ability to score that try in the 80th minute when he's put in all that, special, mm. special talent. And at no point did you think he wasn't going to score that try? Like you're seeing two blokes come across and you thought, no, nah, he's got this. Is that what you thought, Bryn? Yeah, I think any time he gets himself into space, and um, myself included, knowing even if it's a one-on-one tackle, it's, he's tough to stop. So a full head of speed and 
you know, even at the point, like Chip said, it's the 80th minute of the game and being able to have those repeated efforts after efforts that he does in games with to pick and go defensively and then being able to, you know, at full speed, um, being able to finish off that try in the 80th minute just shows how fit he is and the kind of form that he has. But for me, I've actually gone Will Jordan for the uh, player of the round, I think, in our game. And no doubt we'll touch on it in our game, but, you know, the 66th minute, you know, something that he does out of anything any form of magic just something that he pops up and wins wins games in big moments like that and so been able to finish and been able to be on the inside of um of george bridge who made a nice line break as well so but i've got for will jordan he's um best on park for me during round two tony brown and scott robertson both said will jordan best player in the country right now do you agree no but honestly i reckon Artie, like for the amount of work he does he, he's in unbelievable form but i'm always going to pick a forward let's be honest Actually, I, th- I think I misquoted them there. I think they said that he was the difference in the match, and then I said he's the best player in the country oh, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Got that a little bit wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Tony my Brown. Apologies. My apologies. Aaron Smith over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies on that. Um, but quite an incredible player. Oh, unbelievable. I mean, especially that last try. Like, it's just literally just dragging people to the try line. But I, I, it's the little things for me that he does off the ball that I, I think make him great. And yes, there's the, the tries, but the work he does to get there and be in a position to do the special things is probably more important than what we see when he's got ball in hand. Mm, mm. I think what he's also done as well, and probably it's been a, a progression in his game, is probably that draw and pass of finishing players and putting them away. I think it was probably a work on early in his career. Um, you know, there was a couple of times when that draw and pass to finish probably wasn't where, the, where it wanted to be, whether it be right out in front or behind the shoulder or just... Um, a bad pass and so you know in the first two weeks he's actually scored tries but at the same time he's actually put guys away like Leicester and then um, obviously other examples of when he's done that as well now you talked about Artie what about Julian at number 12 that's quite impressive we, we got ourselves a new Nani Lamape in, in the midfield there potentially but what I really liked about Julian's performance is when it mattered he stood up and said give me the ball you know, in that last 20 minutes, he was a big factor of getting some good gain line carries, some good carries off the kickoff, um, and, and defensively as well. You know, like with, with Roger and um, Reeks coming through that channel, you know, they were pretty solid for the most part. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he made a really good... I was really in, interested to see how he went, and I think he made a really good fist of it. But we'll get to that dream team midfield a little bit later. I, I don't want to lose. I, I, don't, I don't want to lose my nerve too early. Combined with Balen Sullivan, another relative look rookie in the midfield in Super Rugby. What did you think of that combo there, Bryn? I mean, completely brand new combo. It seemed to go all right. No, look, it did. I think um, the two touches that probably stand out for me with Balen was when we first set up that try with a little kick in behind, and yes, it comes back to. The, probably the communication that was given to seeing where that space was, but to be able to execute it for Wes Goosen's try, it's a, um, a great ability to be able to have it as a midfielder, especially, you know, you want to be a ball carrier, but having those subtle touches of having a kicking game was really good. And then you look at that pass that he gives to Artie Severe when he obviously yeah. fends off Roger Tuivasa Shek, and that at full speed, don't, honestly, for our viewers, how hard that is to be able to go running at full speed, get about give about a 20-metre pass flat to Artie, and the difference of having that ball in front and being able to have Artie running at full tit to be able to then beat those two defenders with Sam Nock and I don't know who the other player was coming across. Harry Plummer. But the difference of having that out of yeah, Harry Plummer, having that in front or having it in the back and then Artie then be able to have to get the speed to then get into into full gear. So look, I was really impressed with those two big moments because look, those that's probably the winning of the game, um, those two moments that Balin had um, a massive input input in. After watching that, do you stick with them in the Hurricanes midfield? Oh, I think you can't go away from those two big plays, I agree. Um, that, that deft kick was almost more impressive than the finishing fend. Yeah. Um, that was a nice touch. And, and the Safa Moor runs quite a tight line, so there wasn't much of a gap. You know how easy it is for a foot to get in the way there, Bryn, if you put one through? Yeah. And he just found it perfectly. And because the Safa ran that tight line, that's what made it so hard for Harry to turn and cover because he needed to have that connection as well. So... Every player on that edge played their role perfectly. Describe what you mean by tight line. Oh, he just ran. So if I'm running towards commit you, he, he ran a sort of down line, as Bryn says, into that space where he kicked. Coming against the grain. Yeah, and, and that drew that defender and the Blues defender. So it made that gap quite tight. And to get a grubber through there 
Well, it's it's messy. Like it was, uh, it, was a, it was soccer skills. Mm, between him and Zahn, there's some yeah. skills in that family. Oh yeah, and I think they're both starting to stand up at Super Rugby level now. Uh, I think we've seen it in, in patches at um, NPC. Zahn more so in Super last year, but um, you know Balen's certainly put his name on the map now. Hey, well, we've been going for ten minutes. We haven't really talked about RTS yet, so let's get into it. Eh? As far as the debut goes in Super Rugby, that was pretty damn good. What did you like about it? Oh, just, I think he's something different. You mentioned about Julian being Nani, but there's a little bit of that, like the power in his carry, his ability to always get between defenders and like explode out the other side. Um, and, and some of those carries off the kickoff, those are tough carries and he's just, he's into it. I and mean, I thought he was really good defensively. I know everyone's going to look at that missed tackle and he probably just let um, Balin get on the outside because of Bama's pass, but... He's 14 tackles out of 17 um, in a tough area to defend. Um, Reeks is really good defensively as well. Um, I, man, I, I would say it's probably the best cross-code debut. Like, if you think about Sonny, he went to flanker first in Toulon and, and it took him a while to find his feet even when he came to the midfield here. Um, you know, and that was at MPC. Like, Roger's gone straight into Super Rugby. Um, but I think it's his ability of knowing the game coming all the way through school Yes, there was a bit of a penalty where he didn't release the ball. and But, man, he, he just looked as good as those highlights when he was an 18-year-old kid, didn't he? Like, uh, it was so impressive. Like, oh, I was, I just, I was kind of surprised. Mm. You know, like, it was, it was a real clear clinic except for one missed tackle, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Look, if you, if you look thinking about it, he's had two preseason games and then he's played the first game in, in Super Rugby um, against the weekend. I, look, I thought he was tremendous considering what you need to have as, as a 12 at this level. Um, you know, you can have, you can be classes, you know, as a batting ram and a really good um, ball run and ball carry, which he did really well. You look at the fight through contact and their offload to, to Rico early doors and then um, his footwork off kickoffs and then even in general play as well. You know, that left, left foot step that we've seen so much in the Warriors and the Roosters, um, it's really hard to defend. But it's just the subtle touches that I enjoyed seeing with Roger as well. There was a couple of times that he actually just squared up his man on the edge and then was able to fix a guy and then been able to give that ball away, which I think is a really good improvement um, from, you look at the probably the first two preseason games where he's probably just tucked and carried. But I think that comes back to the facts of like of Rico and being able to give those communication skills, giving them into Roger, to then being able to give those passes and then being able to have a triple threat option, not just carrying, not hearing any voices. So I, I could be wrong on that. There might be information that's coming into him previously, but it just seemed like he was a, a triple threat and not just that could go forward carry ball which I probably saw in the first two preseason games. But really, really good debut, and he's only going to grow and get better um, the more time that he does play. I think Bryn as well with his passing game, his ability to inject himself through defenders and offload is going to be, yep. you know, like that, that's what Sonny was known for, his ability to do that. He, like a couple of times on the weekend, he, he made that look yep. easy when that is not easy. Mm. Um, and if you can get it to someone like Reeks in space, with that pace... Mm. Um, he, he's going to attract defensive attention now. So it may be harder, but what that does is it creates opportunities elsewhere. So he's going to have some challenges he goes through. You know, he's a little bit of an unknown at the moment, but the more video footage people get of him in this game, it'll become harder for him. But that then means they're fixated on someone else, which creates space elsewhere. And when are you going to have Bowden Barrett inside him, Rico Ioane outside him, Talia, who's beating people at will, Caleb Clark, who's beating people on the outside and looking sharp, and Zan Sullivan coming in from the back plus their big ball yep. runners. Boy, you can't focus on one guy. No. I think I think that's the, that's the important part there, there, Ross. I think, like you said, you can have all those players, and they're, you know, on paper, you talk about Bodie, uh, Rico, and, and Roger and that, but Jipper always brings that really good point. That if you're going to get those guys into the game, the grunt work and the forwards being able to get over the advantage on and give that quick ball, like they did, I think, in that first half, um, you know, it was so impressive. I know they... You look at probably that first try that um, was against the run of play, but for that first 20 minutes, they were just dominant. The, the, the ball carriers, the go forward, the animation and everything that was in and around that and the patience. Um, if they can do more things like that, and Jip, you'll probably go on a little bit more, but I was just really impressed with the tight five and the, and the eight unit being able to get that go forward ball for them, for them the edge attack and then being able to play on top of the team as well. Mate, two more tries. The forward st mm. st stood up. You know, man, they, they, yep. they really delivered to make that performance what it is. And I thought Finlay Christie as well. Man, how quick he was getting to the breakdown. I don't know what his GPS numbers were in that first 40, but 
man, it was hectic. And those forwards just kept bouncing up, kept delivering and, and creating opportunities. And even my boy Romano, God, he looked good in blue, didn't he? <laughs> I struggled seeing that, mate. I'll be honest. Jeez, it wasn't, defensive wasn't line right out too. A couple of early defensive steals. God, it was a thing of beauty. <laughs> Boys are very fortunate to have the big man there. He's a nice, <laughs> no, he played, played really well, Jip. No, he did. So, so did um, Josh Goodhue. Yeah, well. They all did. Yep. So what happens? Why in the last 30 minutes, after such a dominant performance all the way through, did this fall apart? Well, I think it's easy to look at the Blues, but I think you have to credit um, the Hurricanes' mm. ability to stay in games and a couple of their key leaders, you know, it, was, it wasn't easy as well. Like Geordie went off around the 60-minute mark or 58-minute mark, and and Ruben Loves comes on, and he just he looked really comfortable um, in his role. And and guys like Julian really st stood up, and we're speaking about Artie, but um, their forwards, uh, I think that's where it changed. They really muscled up the Hurricanes, and a lot of those tries that Celeste just walks in um, un untouched is due to a lot of the work the forwards did by sucking in defenders and that just tied in the right. Blues D line and then it just made it a little bit all too easy to, to get that ball to yeah. Celeste. So I don't think it's all about what did the Blues do. I think it was the, the tactical shifts um, and follow me sort of mindset that the Hurricanes forward pack had that, mm. that did the damage and it allowed them and then a, a probably two moments of brilliance mm. um, and we know the yeah. one with, with Balin. I think I think Probably two replacements who I thought were were massive for them was Brandon Yossi and Flanders. I thought their injection coming off the bench, and you talked about Ruben Love, who I thought um, came on and added as well. But you know the touches that Yossi had in that second half, just being able to get over the advantage line, offload, or even squaring up, and then being able to get them put put players into space. You know I think he's one guy that um, I thought was massive on the weekend, being able to with the likes of Adi, who we know that's a, a really good carry and being able to to work really hard, but. I think the likes of bringing those two on, or Flanders and Yossi, I thought they were tremendous on the weekend and added a lot, and probably one of the reasons why they scored three tries in the last 10 minutes. So what's the conversation in Blues camp then? You've gone through, and like you said, some of the best rugby they've played in a decade, and then you lose it, but you know <coughs> what you can do. So how do they feel? I think they have to feel pretty positive. Like you, You've got to acknowledge what the facts were, and, and that was some of the best footy, but now it's just fine-tuning the decision-making. So... Not letting sides in, so no intercept passes, you know, no easy turnovers that lead to points, um, and and making sure that you know, like, games are 80 minutes of, you know, a multiple little moments, and you know you have to win a hell of a lot to win games, and that momentum shift can turn so easily. And I think it's just a reminder how ruthless this comp is, um, and it takes no prisoners. Mm. You you only have to turn off, and I think it was two moments defensively, that that let. Um, the Canes have a sniff to believe that they could come back and win it, and that's all it takes. You know, out of 80 minutes, it's it's two moments of three or four seconds. And a touch and go score in the corner from Celeste Rayasi, that could have gone the other way, and it all would have been different. Yeah, 100%. But the opportunity could have been um, stopped before that, if if you know what I mean, because there was a few defensive guys that weren't on the same page. Whereas in that first half, they were really well connected and, and knew what they were about. Let's talk Celeste Rayasi in this left wing spot, Bryn. Celestia, I feel, is a guy who's shown a lot of talent over a long period of time, but maybe hasn't had the consistent run at Super Rugby that he probably deserves. Um, are we going to see that this year? And if we see that, how does he stack up against Caleb Clark and Les Defying Anuku and those big, powerful left-wingers that are around? Oh, look, he, he's right up there. You, know, you look at, we talk, like you said, Ross, the Bunnings NPC and probably Modicin Cup the last two, three years, he's been at the focal point of their Auckland squad and scoring tries and, you know, making, um, you know, breaks and tries out, out of nothing. And so probably just hasn't had the opportunity at Super Rugby level because there's just been a, you know, there's been so many good players that have been in that Hurricanes back three. So probably hasn't been able to have an opportunity on the wings. But, you know, you look on the weekend and I thought previously when we played him in the, in the preseason, he was the best player on park for them. And, you know, but in saying that, like I said, they've got a lot of depth there with Jules and then Wes Goosen, who's been there for a while and who's played really, really well. But no, I think for him, he's a guy that you look on the field and he, anything that can happen. And so when it comes into those situations of tight games, you look at Will Jordan, you know, for us, you need a player like that that can just change it and then be able to um, change the game right then and there with his ability. And so Celestia Reyes, he does that. But I think for him, again, it's just the consistency of probably the work off the ball and being able to get himself into the game when um, things aren't going his way. You know, like I said, um, the ball came to him a lot on those little on those on the edge and was able to finish. But I think for him, it's those second and third efforts of like 
what Will Jordan does and being able to, and Leicester does that as well, off the work off the ball, that he can get himself involved in the game. But um, a great start and you know, we'll probably, um, hopefully, get some more consistent rugby under his belt in the next couple of weeks. Is it too early to say he's got the front running for that left wing spot? I know we're only two rounds in, but... Um, well, I did some deep diving into this. Hey, here we go, um, the book. Yeah. Um, and choosing that uh, left wing was quite challenging. Um, and this is going to sound biased, because everyone's going to think I've just chosen a Blues player, but Caleb Clark stacks up as the form winger, in, in, in my opinion, just purely because statistically he, he had eight carries, got 91 metres, which was more per carry than any other player. All those carries were gain line. Leicester was, uh, you know, the week before was really high. Again, really p- impressive this week. And then um, Slesi Rayasi was, was good. But where they differ is defensively. Mm. So different D systems, I understand that. But, you know, Slesi and Leicester are around the 85% mark defensively and, and Caleb was at 100. And so that's where, because I couldn't pick it. Honestly, when you watch on face value, it's such a hard position to pick. Um, and then I was like, well, I'm going to have to go in to see where the point of difference is. And that's where I went with this week in terms of form is, is defensive accuracy. Even though Celeste made a great play and, and Corey Jane would have loved it because it's his beautiful D system <laughs> with that intercept, um, it can be quite key on the left flank um, around those defensive decisions as well. You know it's not beautiful? Corey Jane's haircut. <laughs> that is, and actually Balen Sullivan too. There's some average um, haircuts going around, Bryn. I think it's the fashion, the mullet, isn't it? Well, it is it? It's if you're a player. It's good on to see Corey still got hair to be able to do it. So if you played him, probably have a net at that, um, at that age. So he looks, um, he looks quite sharp. We saw him, saw him on the weekend. So fair played on. The Bryn's far too classic, yeah. short back and sides to get into that kind of stuff, eh? He is. He, he, he <laughs> likes to look sharp, slick and sharp. Look good. He used to always say to me, "Look good, feel good, play good." Yeah. And then I'd say, "Bryn, play well." <laughs> if, you, oh. if your grammar is good, you're uh, gonna play well he doesn't miss me at all. That's that King's College <laughs> education, isn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, I, yeah, that's it, mate. Kings, you know, St. Peter's, unfortunately, you've seen, you know, just going as um, special as Kings. What do, you, what do you think about that left wing spot there, Brenner? I know you'll, you'll be backing your boy Leicester. Yeah, it's oh, it's tough, mate. There's like those three guys there. They could, um, you know, any three of them could be in that position. But I actually went, I actually went Celeste Rayasi just for the fact of he did make that defensive read and being able to. That's obviously how the um, the Hurricanes like having that intercept. And it was probably much. It was a 14 point play in, in my mind. You know, the Blues in that first stanza were really dominant, and then being able to, you know, take that momentum away from from them and then being able to score that try. It felt like a 14 point play for me. Um, and then the finishing ability as well for one of his tries um, in the 75th minute, I believe. Um, you know, they don't get themselves in a position to be able to score that third try unless that last try, sorry, if he doesn't score that. And it was a hell of an effort to be able to do that. And then, um, yeah, I think, again, Leicester's played really, really well. I think not that he didn't score as many tries as he did on the weekend, but the offloads that he was able to put players away and really tough and condensed defensive um, pressure that the Highlanders put on us was being able to get them away and being able to set us up for phases to then score tries. Um, and then, again, Caleb Clark, his first game back, running a beautiful cross line and to score his try. Oh, Finlay Christie, who I thought was outstanding, and then um, defensive as well, like you talked about. Um, he was um, very, very efficient. But I've, I've gone Celestia Rayasi. He was my pick for this week, but really, really tight. You can go either or the way with the three that are playing at the moment. Yeah, 100%. I think it's the best version of... Caleb Clark we've seen like I know he was outstanding in 2020 when he made the All Blacks but I reckon it's the best I've seen him play you know his decision making to back his pace or go you know through players you know I think he you know six defenders beaten you know three clean breaks way more than any other winger on the weekend I think it's exciting for where he, he can get to and, and what opportunities can be presented to him and he's he's mentioned publicly that Rogers brought the best out they've, they've been glued to each other in that off season didn't get that NPC um, for the amount of time off for footy, that was one hell of a shift. Mm. And, and you could see when he celebrated his try, he's a man with a connection to Inga, a man yeah. with a connection to Joely. You know, that game meant a lot to him. 100%. And, and that's why I didn't really want to make my comparison about him going on the outside. But if you watch both those clips together, um, it, it's pretty um, formidable how, how similar it is. And yeah, massive, massive day for him mm. you know, to, to be able to perform the way he did and, and show, that, show that spirit. Big game for you guys down against the Highlanders. Uh, 
pretty solid when they're 34 19 Bryn, what were you happy about from that game oh probably the finish being able to, to finish that game look i thought the, the highlanders in that first probably 10 15 minutes really brought the intensity to us and um, unfortunately penalties in the first early part of the of the first 20 minutes um, put us on the back foot but you could just see feel on the sideline that um, the intensity and the defensive pressure that they're putting on us and then you know we really had to grind our way back and um, you know Seve gets a quick tap to be able to put us in score our first load of points and then been able to score a try as well and then another try and then just for half time very similar to the week we had before against the uh, Hurricanes we had a penalty to go um, to go ahead and into half time and then I think it just kind of went back and forth at 40 to the 60 mark, just um, on each other's out, everybody th- throwing every- everything at us and then went back and forth. And then uh, I think it just came back to that moment with Will Jordan, uh, really opened up the game for us. And then um, our forwards and that last stanza probably muscled up a little bit, um, especially with Tams's try to finish off. I think um, just the ability to stay in it. I think we probably saw in the first half that they were spreading the field really well, Jip, and you probably would have seen that. They spreaded the field really well and, we actually came into half time and thinking if we picked and go through the middle to be able to tighten them up, um, we'd get a little bit more pay out of that. And, you know, you look at Tom, um, Tom's, Tom's last try, um, you know, we went pick and go from about 15 metres out, went right through the heart, and then, you know, Tom saw that little whack line um, against the grain. So overall, it was a really tough game. I know there was a few few sore bodies after that game, like there usually is with the, with the derby, but um, I thought the Highlanders were a lot better um, than they were in week one, and uh, we're very, very fortunate and really happy to get a bonus point win in, a, in a such a hotly contested um, game on the weekend. You lads would have been happy 10 minutes in, four penalties, and then mm. you only you know, had seven for the other 70. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. that's pretty good um, ability to switch that on its head, because it's been a talking point the week before where you probably couldn't rein it in, but there definitely was, mm. there must have been some chat that, that managed that well. Yeah, it was, Jip. It was talked about a lot during the week around not giving these guys opportunities because like, their line-out ability and their variety that they have with specials, going into four-mans, um, rip plays. You know, The more time we gave away penalties, it just gives them opportunities to be able to go into their games and giving Tony Brown and their attack um, a lot more opportunities. And so it was disappointing the first four penalties within the first 10, 15 minutes because we talked about it so much. But I think the the movements that we made from last week is we were actually able to listen identified and been able to connect and been able to get the results from that and not been able to then infringe and have more penalties against us so um, for us we always want to evolve and we always want to get better so look we don't want to have those four penalties moving forward but I think the important thing and the positive um, response from that like you said was just being able to have six seven seven penalties through the rest of the game and you know not putting ourselves under pressure like we did the previous week. I think as well what probably differentiates you guys at the moment um, is your defence. Defence wins championships. We know you and I are, are both big believers in that. And why I say that, it's so easy to always look at the tries. Like you guys scored four, the Highlanders scored one. But the Highlanders actually had more rucks in your 22 than you guys had in theirs. And, and your ability to score points when you're in opposition 22 is a strength. But your ability mm. to stop is incredible. Like the amount of pressure you're under mm. at times. Your defensive systems and your defensive coach must just love the way you boys front up when it gets close to your goal line. Yeah, it is, Jip, and I think, you know, you probably look at last week, we were operating around that 80, 81%, which probably isn't a standard that we've been um, accustomed to, and so um, Tom's had a really good week with us around um, gearing us and giving us the right pitches first and foremost, because like like you know, Jip, when you play the Highlanders, there's so much variety around their play, especially when you've got the likes of Aaron Smith running, running the cutter with quick ball, Falau Fakatava in the second half, especially when he wants to run and be able to play um, it's really tough to defend. So I think for us, seeing the cues and being able to prepare really well, we knew what was coming um, against us. And so when you've got that confidence and, and clarity around that, it's really a, more so just an execution of getting, getting your tackle right. So, um, you know, you probably would have saw a, a lot in that first half. They went down that short side a lot, snapping back to the short side, and they probably previewed us and thought there was a, um, a weakness or somewhere they could have um, got us there. But, you know, our defensively, we really owned that. And then making really good decisions at the ruck. I thought we were really good around that, which is probably the previous week, if you look at, um, they went through the heart, I can't remember who scored our try, their try last week for the Hurricanes, but uh, we tidied that up really nicely. And so, um, still a lot more improvement. I think we can get off the line a little bit faster, but I think overall for week two, a uh, massive improvement from the week previous against the Hurricanes. 
Mm. Ethan DeGroote, Josh Timu, James Lynch's on top of coming off a couple mm. of weeks without wins, that's a big hit for them. Uh, is that a major concern for the Highlanders? Um, probably not at this stage. I think Lynch's would be the most concerning. Like, I think he's a big part of their forward pack, obviously a big part of their leadership. Um, and, and just probably they've had players leave where they've had a lot of depth in that seven. Probably isn't there, you know, with Dylan Hunt. He's, he's moved on and um, Billy Harmon's came down there as well and challenged out as well. So I think he's key to get back on the field. Um, I love watching James Lynch's play. Like, he's just another typical seven that throws his body around and I think other players feed off that. So that's a big one. Um, the other two are potentially coverable if some other guys come back from injury and having a guy like Daniel Leonard Brown who's had so much super experience it's not as drastic um, but hopefully they can get back I think it's just a rib um, for Ethan so that can potentially be injected and, and played through but or they might be wanting to get it 100% before hitting them out. Bryn one of the tough parts for the Highlanders this week will be the last 10 minutes because the Hurricanes in the last 10 minutes of their last two games have scored six tries and 38 points. Um, yeah. What do they have to do to prevent this late onslaught? Well, no doubt it's just identifying it first and foremost and knowing that they're a strong team. And so, you know, no doubt Tony and, and the coaching staff and the players will be addressing that and saying, look, we've got to be able to stay on for minutes, knowing that the last two weeks that, you know, they've piled on a lot of points. So um, I think it'll just be, that'll be previewed in the week with their defense and been able to um, have that mindset to stay on for the whole 80. Um, but again, I think more importantly, the bench when they do come on for the Highlanders, it's been able to add that same impact that the that the Hurricanes have done the last two weeks. Like I said, to you, the likes of Flanders, Ruben Love came on the weekend, and Yossi, um, I thought they were outstanding. So um, Tony Brown's probably hoping to be able to get the same um, impact off his bench, but then just, like I said, been able to stay on for that whole 80, knowing that um, the Hurricanes finished strong the last two weeks. Mm. Just back to your team again. To Mighty Williams, Ollie Jaeger, um, Razor said that they could be All Blacks. In inverted commas, are their efforts on the weekend enough to make you think that these are the two kind of props that the All Blacks are after, Jipper? Um, I definitely, like, I've been really impressed with Oli Jaeger's skill set the first two weeks. Mm. Um, he's always been a good scrummager, always good at the tight stuff, but, man, some of his attacking skill set, he's clearly put some work in there. Um, you know, similar to Tark Furlong, how we spoke about how he stays square hips and he gives those balls out the back where he gives tips. Um, you know, there's definitely been an, a, a lift in his his game in that area. To, to Mighty Williams, I think he's he's definitely got some potential, man. Big body, um, and and is hungry to be in and around that ball on attack. So uh, I, the one thing I like about this though is Scott Robinson's the best at promoting his players. Eh? Like he <laughs> he's so good at just laying that many seeds out there, and and it sort of shows you why. Um, you know, the, all these lads want to play for him because he believes so much in each individual. I think he probably thinks his whole team could be All Blacks. Um, and he'd be genuine about it. Um, and, and, and his success warrants that belief. But I, I do love how he, he, he sends those little messages out there. Unfortunately, they haven't locked down that tight head spot on the dream team, but they're, they're definitely knocking on the door. <laughs> well, just the yellow card the week before, you know, Ollie just, he's really impressed with the yellow card, you know. OK, let's talk about the Dream Team and interview it. Int introduce it, sorry. Introduce it, I'll use my words. Introduce it to our viewers slash listeners. Uh, rugby Pass's Super Rugby Dream Team is something that you can enter on a weekly basis at rugbypass.com. Go to rugbypass.com slash superrugbypacific slash dream team. Register for free. Even if you missed last week, you can still go through and do that team for last week. Pick your team. The person who's closest to the overall team each week will be selected out of the draw. You'll win a Rugby Pass Plus subscription for the year, which is great on a week-by-week -week basis. In fact, we've got our first winner, who is Ishara De Silva. The other thing that we can win is over the course of a year, if you are the most consistently close to the overall team, which is taken from everyone's selections and put together as the dream team, you will win a spot, whether you like it or not, on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Oh, Come on. What a treat. <laughs> what an absolute what treat. What an absolute treat. I'm sure it'll be a highlight of your life, possibly. I don't know. You come on here, give us your hot takes, and rip into the boys for whatever you disagree with them with. So <laughs> that should be a bit of a fun as the season goes by. Let's talk a little bit about the weekend. Let's talk about this midfield action we've talked about a little bit. In your dream teams, was that the hardest spot to pick? Yeah, that or the back three. 
there's so yep. many, like the back three is ridiculous actually. Probably the back three um, is hardest, but I went with Julian at 12 and, and Reeks at 13. Um, and, and just purely again, um, every 12 and 13 had great attacking stats, but defensively those two shone um, in terms of their accuracy and ability to uh, make sure. I, I just think it's a key part um, you know, to be nailed down if, you, if you're going to be successful in that midfield because that's what makes that position so hard is the defensive abilities of it. Mm, mm. So who's in your back three? My back three? I've gone Caleb Clark, the left wing, yeah. Sevi Reese, the right, yeah. and Will Jordan at 15. But, man, between him and Jordan Bar- Jordy Barrett, it's hard. Mm. And then in your midfield? Mm. Julian <coughs> and Reeks. Julian and Reeks. Yeah. It's tough to stop ball in hand. That particular dream team outside back combo. What about you, Bryn? Um, I actually went. I went Rog. I went Rog. I think I was pretty impressed with his performance on the weekend. Um, and then I've also gone Balin. Oh, yeah, I've gone for Sullivan as well. The, the performance that he on the, had on the weekend. And like I talked about, moments in games and the two moments that he had were massive um, in that Hurricanes victory. And then the back three. Um, I wanted to put Leicester, but you know, I think Celeste Rouse. The way I just talked about him, I had Celeste. Had Sevi Reese for his two trials on the weekend and the way he worked, and then Will Jordan, I had a fullback, but Geordie Barrett is, is in and around there as well, just with his performance on the weekend as well. You know what I love about Sevi is he just finds a way to get in the game. Like, there's not many players yep. that sprint off their wing to do that quick tap and score, but that's a momentum shifter, and it's so like powerful for a team. Um, his, his energy, smile on his face, and ability to do that is a lot harder than he makes look. Uh, but he's got a lot of courage to do it. I, I, I go back to Balin. The only reason, um, you know, I agree he had big moments. I thought Isaiah Parisi as well in the Waratahs was extremely good at centre, but both of them were around that 50-60 tackle percentage. And I just think it, it, in, in this game, at Super Rugby level, if, you, if you're tackling at 50%, you are going to, you know, let teams have some opportunities. Uh, this week, the Moana Pacifica players have got a chance to get into this dream team. You know, they've been having to wait. Uh, what do you think will come off this weekend against the Crusaders for the Moana Pacifica team? Oh, look, I think there'll just be a lot of energy and excitement to be able to be playing. They've, they've gone through a real challenging patch, you know, with, with isolation and getting their team back on, on deck. But I think there's a lot of excitement, a lot of focus um, in their um, environment. And, and I just think they need to take the lessons they had against the Chiefs, because that's the sort of marker of, of Super Rugby and understanding that balance of play. And, and I think they can learn from the Drua a little bit um, of being composed in, in certain moments. So if you use the Drua, for example, on the weekend, they'd been on D and held the Brumbies out 10, 15 minutes. They got a penalty under their sticks, like they're out on their feet and they took a quick tap. Mm. And, mm. It ju- and, then it, and that ball was turned over within two phases and the Brumbies scored. So you, you, you can't be your own worst enemy. You've got to be really cl- composed and you've got to be really clear on what your game plan is and also understanding the impacts of defence, not only in the current moment of the game in the first half when you're all energy and you can do a quick tap, but for later in the game and how, how that can potentially allow teams to pull away. So I think that'll be the key focus. Yeah, I, let's put you in an awkward spot again, Brent, because we love to do this whenever the Crusaders <laughs> are about to play somebody. Uh, what is a successful debut for Moana Pacifica against your team? Oh, look, I think it's just been able to take the learners of what they had last the last time they played against the Chiefs. Um, you know, we talked about set-piece parity and being able to win their own line-out ball. Um, that's going to be massive for them coming this week. And then also scrum time as well, um, you know, against us or, you know, um, New Zealand teams. You know, you've got to be able to win your set-piece and it showed against the Chiefs. If you don't win that, um, you're not going to get many opportunities and then not going to be able to score points off that you know you look at us or any teams that get into that kind of 22 zone with the line out or scrum you know we end up scoring points or scoring a try you know what i mean so that's probably the biggest thing for the for the minor pacifica this week and moving forward not just against us has been able to win their set piece ball and been able to um to win that at a consistent basis and then been able to get their identity of what their structure wants to be uh, we all know that um, they have a great ability of flair being able to play but like the draw um, it's been able to have those opportunities um, when they do have them and then not being able to, you know, lose ball really through the first couple of phases, being able to own your set piece, get your, your maps of what you want to the first couple of phases, and then being able to play off that. And then defensively more so as well, um, being able to be in your structure and being able to make teams really work for it, work for their tries or work for them. Um, whereas, you know, you don't want it to be 
cut through the middle or defensive area just through the fact that they're not on the same page. So that's probably why I think Aaron Major and that coaching group is you know a couple of things that they'll be looking forward to, and uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for them. You know, they've been waiting um, obviously with COVID um, and in Queenstown, but uh, they're playing in Dunedin. It's going to be a, a special night for that for the, for a lot of those men being able to put on that jersey for the first time in a meaningful um, Super Rugby Pacific game. The, the irony a little bit is um, it's probably a good side for them to come up against first because Eddie and Nari will have a good database of knowledge <laughs> on your, uh, you know, your, your styles and how, how you guys go about your prep. And obviously Aaron Major as well having represented the Crusaders. So um, I do think that helps them a little bit for understanding what's coming because I think you have to acknowledge that elephant in the room and understand you know, the, the strengths and the amount of strengths that the Crusaders side has. And then they can almost put that aside early in the week and then focus on just nailing themselves um, rather than getting to game day and maybe being overwhelmed. So I, I think that is a big um, positive in, in, their, in their camp to have that sort of knowledge. Let's jump over the Tasman now. Um, your surprise of the week. Yeah, well, 13 plus is the surprise of the Force Rebels. To, to be honest, I, I back force one to twelve for for their performance against the Brumbies, but man, they were they were ruthless and really clinical, um, and 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 mm. just seems to be building something special in that team. Um, and, and the Rebels, on the other hand, just just high error rates, high penalty count, um, and just an inability to get their game going, um, which surprised me a little bit. Especially with the, they've got some senior Wallabies in that Rebels side as well. So that was my surprise of the week. Um, uh, Waratahs losing to the Reds was unbelievable. Like 70% possession territory. Uh, Waratahs had yeah. 28 defenders beaten to four. Uh, that's some serious ticker from Brad Thorne and his men to get through that. Like the Waratahs, that is the one that slipped away. And then yeah. uh, the Drew, I sort of just touched on it. You know, they were just their own worst enemy. They they played far too much rugby, and and you know they were paid. They paid the price dearly against the Brumbies. One of the big talking yeah. points over the Tasman, Bryn, uh, Tim Horan's called for the f- Force First Five, Rishan Pasitoa, to be called into the Wallabies. You know, after his initial showings against the Rebels, we're talking about a young man, and Michael Checker has completely disagreed. Yeah saying we should not hype these young playmakers and put them in a position where all of the pressure is on them and they're the next big thing. Who do you agree with? I think I agree. I'm actually going to go with Checker on this, actually, because, look, I think, um, look, he's, you know, Pussy Tour, I thought he was you know, great on the weekend, and I, we all touch on probably a little bit more around the force and how they how they won that game, but I think you do need to be careful. You know, you look at Lola Sear, who's a pretty, a pretty good example around this, um, a young man who was playing with the Brumbies and then, Obviously, Quade Cooper, Quade Cooper came back and was been able to learn off that. So, I think if they are going to be able to put him in the squad, it's been able to have that kind of nurturing him in to be able to like see what it's all about. You know, very similar to an apprentice with the All Blacks, what they've done with young men coming through the system. So, um, I think Checker is right. It's been able to nurture him and been able to give him consistency and playing in Super Rugby. You know, I think it's great that he's been able to play. You know, he hopefully plays the next four or five weeks against those Australian teams and then um, we'll get a good instruction playing the New Zealand teams and what, what that what that's all about, especially for a young kid coming through. So I think if they do go that way, we've been able to bring him in the squad, I think in that kind of apprenticeship role, have Lola Sia there, hopefully Quade Cooper's in around and he can learn in the apprenticeship role and then been able to, you know, you know spend a bit of time in camp and then if given an opportunity later in the year um, if he is selected. So I think they do need to be careful. I think they really do need to be careful and I, I agree with Checker's comments, definitely. I- I think as well, like we got a great picture of how ruthless international rugby is for first fives. Mm. Um, and if you use yep. Quade Cooper exact example of last year, experienced, measured, came in, you know, and nailed it. Whereas Noah was outstanding Super Rugby, and it is just that step up. It's not that he's not he won't have the ability and time, but all those experiences he's getting now will you know, pay dividends later on. And now with someone like Quaid and, and Matt Tamura and James O'Connor around him at that level, he might just have to bide his time a little bit more before he can really own it. And I think also another example is this morning, um, oh no, sorry, Monday morning, um, is Carberry and Sexton. Mm. So Carberry against Italy, maybe a little bit to skelter missed a few kicks, um, you know, got the shepherd's hook and Sexton came on and just... It down. Man, it's just yeah. and it just shows the difference. You just cannot buy experience, um, and you don't mm. want to rush that. T- time in and around yeah. environment 
is just as valuable as I know they've got to learn at some stage, get out on the field, but you don't want to rush that process. Oh yeah, well, that's a good point to move into the Six Nations then, because there's not a huge amount of experience, a small amount of experience in this French team. These guys have got 20, 30 caps, but they are absolutely killing it right now. Certainly are. I mean, what I, what I noticed on the weekend is their decision making, both sides of the ball. So on attack, um, you know, when they got turnovers, their click plays led to led to tries. Um, their efforts and chase line, um, their decision making. So Dupont leading the way as skipper makes a massive break. And um, I just feel the French sides of old would have chanced their arm with a 50-50. He takes it down to a, down to the ground. Another player steps up, plays half. They run holes, run holes, try. And then on defence. You know, I spoke about maybe over committing against the Irish and probably could have lost that game if we used Jamison Gibson Parks try. But their de decision making around the breakdown, the amount of turnovers they got at the breakdown defensively was huge. And mm. they, they didn't waste any bodies at all. During, if it was lost, they left, they spread the field, they deed up really well. And their, their ability to make the Scots do, try and do something special, if you look at Stuart Hogg's um, knock on. You know, there was three or four guys around um, Harris as well and probably didn't need to go for the speculator because you spoke about how hard it is that pass Balin gave Artie. Like, that is a tough pass. Um, and there was yeah. just one defender, but it was just the pressure <coughs> and, and the, I suppose the mystique of them at the moment um, puts pressure on teams as well. World Cup favourites, Bryn, right now? Oh look, I think they're, yeah, I think they are. They're, they're definitely right up there. I think we talked about last week, Jip. You know, this was kind of that banana skin game where they're expected to win. And last year, you know, they probably slipped up with not with not winning the games that they were supposed to. So, you know, look, I thought, man, they are so exciting. I, I look forward to to watching the French team with how they're playing. You know, I, and I'm a, I love watching Dupont. You look, you know, he's he's, bloody, he's, he's counter attacking from fullback and beating <laughs> guys left, right, and centre for 50, 60 metres. No other nine in the world is doing that. And then. You know, they're playing on top of teams with their skill set and their big men as well that we've talked around the, the growth of the Northern Hemisphere and where their level are, their, for, their tight forwards and their forwards as well. And look, I thought, you know, Dante and, and um, Fiku were outstanding in those turnover areas. You know, you talked around the defensive mindset of, of the French and, you know, the amount of turnovers that Dante and Fiku had in that, in that, in that stanza with, of play um, was really impressive. And then their click attack and their... Their counter attack off turnovers, you know, it's, um, you know, we talk about New Zealand rugby, that's our, been our biggest strength over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. But, you know, the French, um, they're making teams really pay. And that's probably where they, they, beat Scot um, they beat Scotland with those click attacks and been able to uh, be real, just ruthless around scoring mm -hmm. points off their own mistakes, you know. And, you know, you look at that Van der Merwe when he breaks through and then you talk to Aaron Harris with that bridge ball, that was probably a massive turning point in the game as well. And, you know, the difference of Hulk scoring that. I mean, you almost just felt the guy could listen to the commentators, the the kind of the just the drop in their hearts of the Scottish with that kind of um, with that with hog knocking that on because it was such a pivotal moment in the game and they've done so hard to be able to try and fight back um, against the French and so um, Scotland were great but they just missed too many opportunities in that game whereas the French were just far more ruthless and were way more clinical and was probably the difference with how clinical and ruthless they were in those moments. So Hogg and Russell, two guys with a lot of hype around them and a Scottish team that has been talked about as a team that's you know on the up are now copying a lot of grief for not being necessarily the complete players, for probably chancing their arm. In the case of Finn Russell, efforts being questioned. Uh, are those legitimate criticisms of these two blokes? Oh, it just shows how, um, I suppose, ruthless and fickle it can be, this game. Like, uh, you know, that's, we celebrated them the new style, the new way that they've brought to Scottish rugby and their ability to do special things. And then the one game it doesn't come off, they're just, they've, you know, they <laughs> resort back to saying things mm. about these players mm. from their past, yeah. rather than actually having, uh, um, you know, like it's easy to resort back to talking about effort with Finn, Finn Russell when he's had the, the checkered history that he's had. But uh, I think it's unfair to say that now. And, and I think, Man, I don't know how you can have a crack at Stuart Hogg. He's still in my dream team. One knock on does not change mm. that man and the ticker he has for, for the Scotland. So I think it's mm. really uncalled for um, and almost felt, feels like someone's um, waiting to have a crack. Yeah. What I, what I, do, think, what I, what I do think, though, Jip, is, um, which is probably good for Scottish rugby, is that the expectation is that they should be winning those games. Do you know what I mean? And so... 
it's the growth that they've had with Townsend and the growth that they've had in their, in their squad that, you know, like we said, we think, you know, five of those teams can win the Six Nations Championship with the rugby that they're playing. And so, look, I think it's, I agree with you, Jim, it's poor to be able to put the effort of, of Finn Russell, who, you know, obviously just one game that, you know, there's a few things. Stuart Hogg, you know, probably nine times out of ten catches that ball, score a try, and then, you know, could be different uh, moving forward in that game. So, um, I just think it's good for Scotland rugby the, for the fact that the expectation is that they should be winning these games or being more closer. But no, to be honest, I'll take that back. They should be winning the games. You know, we talked about last week, um, the week before, they should have won that game against Wales. You know, so um, I just think it's good for Scottish rugby. The expectation is, you know what, we should be winning these games and we're just not participating. Probably you would have thought probably five, six years ago. They're still a great team, though. Like, some of the players, like, they had some great moments. It was just, you know, like, the French were really good and, and as Bryn's words, ruthless. Like, they targeted those guys because they know how key they are and they got results from it. Like, it's, they'll learn from that and adjust and... and um, I, I don't know, sometimes the credit needs to go to the team that's won the game as well. You, you, when yeah. you're so passionate about these teams, you're fixated on your players. Whereas, um, yeah. you know, on some, like, I got the best advice ever. I think it was Mick Byrne or something when I was young. He goes, some days the guys are going to have a good day. You yeah. know, when, if they steal a line out, don't, don't sulk for a week. It's just, it's happened. Move on, you know. Yeah. Find, take the lesson and, and find the solution for the next time. There's a player playing for England right now who's just become their most capped player, Ben Youngs. He's surpassed mm. Jason Leonard as the most capped English player. Now, Ben Youngs is a guy whose name is always around because of his longevity. But when we talk about the best nines in the world, we're always been talking about, you know, I think the last few years we've had Veruta Prayer, Will Genia, Aaron Smith. Um, now we're talking about Dupont. He's maybe not a guy who has got the credit that he deserves, Brent? Oh, I think he probably has at, at England level. I think any time you play 100 test matches for, for your country, you're doing something right. And so I've been watching him when he was younger in the under-20 system and been able to then go into the um, English squad and been able to do it for you know a decade and have 100 test caps. And so, you know, he had a good battle probably early on in his career with Danny Kerr. They went back and forth for a little bit and, you know, he ended up coming up on top of that. But look, I've, I've, I've rated Ben Youngs the way that he... His game management and what he sees. Um, we talk about Dupont and his running game, but I really enjoy uh, Ben Youngs and he's got the ability to run. But his kicking game and seeing seeing space and then being able to then um, game manage the team with his box kick contestable. You know, you look around, not just this year, but probably the years previous to the, how massive the box kick was. And Ben Youngs was a really good um, at doing that. And so I think, look, any time you can do 100 games at test level, um, bar, you know, you'd probably say he probably is a little bit underrated, but in my mind, um, I think he's been a great servant for English rugby and, you know, probably he's been on Lions tours as well, um, obviously with Conor Murray being there, but um, really rate his ability to play rugby and um, it's, uh, it's a great achievement for a guy that's done it for a very long time. Style of fighters probably doesn't help him um, mm. in the style that England play. So, you know, you, you mentioned Aaron Smith, Will Guinea, DuPont. The style their team plays allows them to probably be a figurehead and, and stand out. Whereas he selflessly plays his role for his team and I think the way he keeps getting selected is because he is a team first and does what's needed on the day and it's never about himself. Uh, and, and I think that's probably his biggest strength. Um, and I think his game management and kicking game is a big part of why England's had a lot of success over the last few years. Mm. Speaking of English success, up 17-0 against Wales. They only went on to win that, what was it, 23-19? Is that a concern before playing France? I think it is in the sense they scored one try to three. Like the Welsh scored three tries. Um, and I know they had to win the game and chance their arm, but the, the French are going to score points. But they're also really good at stopping them. Mm. Um, and you're not going to be able to pick up a win, I don't believe, in threes because their discipline's been quite good. They haven't allowed a lot of entries into the 22 from defence, defensive errors, or teams haven't taken the three against them. So if the French can stick to their guns and, and be disciplined on defence and not give the three-point accumulation, England are going to have to find some attacking flair. And, and they've got the guy there to do it in Marcus Smith. They've, they've got the players. Um, it's just maybe a change in mindset around penalties of going to the corner um, early rather than you know banking the three. Uh, because, like I say, the French are in some form, but they were in this form last year, 
and we all expected them mm. to win the Six Nations. So it's just how, you know, it's both sides of the coin. I think England have the ability, but they may just need to change their style to get mm. the result. Look, I think if you're England, you're playing the French, you talk around DuPont, Intermac, and the be able to play on top of teams. I think if you're in an England camp, you're thinking, like, we need to win this game. The front of us, the, the eight of us, or the, yeah. the, the three forwards on the bench, or whatever the split is, they need to take the ball by the horns and say, look, we are going to win this test match through our dominance, our physicality, and being able to slow down their ball defensively and just beat them up. You know, you look at the, it's a little bit different, you look at the World Cup when, we played the, when they played the All Blacks, they just dominated us physically. You know what I mean? So I can imagine Eddie Jones in that camp will be, you know, about, you know, talking to a few players and saying, I need this from you from this week because you know, there's been a lot of talk around this French team, a lot of hype, which is fair with how they've been played, with how they've been playing, sorry. But um, I can imagine the England forward pack will really take a, um, a massive step to being able to, uh, to win this game on the weekend. Yeah, and if they win it, they're, you know, they're up front of the comp. Yeah. And it's all on. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they've definitely... It's, it's either probably England or France now, isn't it? Ireland potentially there, um, if England can topple France. But uh, that, that's the big game. I mean, we sort of spoke about the banana skid game. There's a few more mm. uh, for France to come. If they can keep that consistency, though, I think they'll go unbeaten. OK, well, let's talk about our picks for Super Rugby Pacific Round 3. Quick fire. Moana Pacifica versus Crusaders. 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 <laughs> Drew or Rebels? Rebels to bounce back. Yeah, Rebels. Force v Reds, Bryn. Force. Force at home. I'm going to go Force as well. Ooh, yes, I like that one. I like that one. Okay, Blues against the Chiefs. Blues. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a good game, man. Uh, I will go. Where's that been played? I know this is quick fire. Where's it been played? Eden Park. Blues at home. Chiefs. Chiefs. I like that. Hurricanes, Highlanders. Man. I like this. The suspense is making me excited for the weekend that you guys can't pick these. Hurricanes. I think the Landers have to win, or else they go zero and three. Oh, Sorry I like it. I like it. We're going to have something to debate next week when this all comes down to it. And finally, Brumbies v Waratahs. Brumbies. Yeah, Brumbies. Brumbies, radio. Well, stick around. Catch all of those games on Sky Sport this weekend. All the analysis on rugbypass.com. I'm Ross Carl. This is James Parsons. That's Bryn Hall down in Christchurch. Another Aotearoa rugby pod, all done and dusted. We'll catch you all next week. I've got to go because otherwise I'm going to be in the dog box tonight when I get home. <laughs>